A very warm welcome from Zurich to all of you participating here in this today's webinar. It's a pleasure for me to be here and it's great that we could solve the last technical issues on the very last minute. So um, we are one minute ahead or behind the time, but that should be fine. Thank you all for joining. I hope everything is clear. If something is not clear, just drop a chat and we try to fix it remotely from here. Today we are here to discuss a comment paper, Sustainability in Global Agriculture Driven by Organic Farming. Um, we have the pleasure to have two authors present and much more the pleasure we have two policymakers who are directly addressed by this paper to comment and discuss uh, this issue. I guess pressure on food and farming systems are, are very, very big. The environment, the society, all these different levers um, somehow um, influencing the food system um, are, are very present. There are societal debate around biodiversity, about the impact of climate on food system, on our life in general. And that's why I think um, it's very key to um, talk about the priorities for pathways for future development of food systems and to be part of this lively debate. This paper is a very good foundation and very good starting point to do so. So we are very happy to discuss this with policymakers and uh, to discuss what kind of policy interventions which were proposed in the paper um, um, could work and how do they, um, how are they perceived by policymakers uh, before the background of the different um, um, framework conditions in different settings. So the objective of today is to explore how current policies can drive sustainability in agricultural and in food systems in general. So let me briefly uh, introduce to you the agenda of, of today. We will hear, hear first an input by two um, authors of the paper, Adrian Müller and Frank Eihorn. And then we have time for two reactions from policymakers on the application of the concept to local conditions um, in Switzerland by Werner Lehmann, who is the director of the Federal Office of Agriculture. And um, also a kind of um, an uh, assessment and a, and a reaction um, from an Indian policymaker, Neraja Adidam, Joint Secretary of the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers' Welfare in India. After this, we will have time for a few follow-up questions and um, we'll then, uh, towards the end, also open the floor to questions from the audience. So you have the chat function and you have the possibility to also um, um, react uh, or interact with us. But before we go off with the intro by Frank and Adrian, a few technical issues. You realized um, until the very last moment, it's probably good to remind us ourselves on, on how we deal in this um, webinar. So best to mute your micro during the entire webinar um, unmuted for the speakers when we ask you to do so. And if you have comments and questions on the topic, but also technicalities, just drop us uh, a message on the chat function. And then we will try to somehow get the different questions together and open up the Q&A session. If you can't or hear us, um, one good um, um, thing or one good suggestion to fix it that's with any electronic device, just switch it off and turn it on again. So get out of the webinar and get in again and hopefully or by uh, miracle most of the problems are solved uh, by doing so. So we will record this webinar and it will be later available um, on the Helvetels website as well. So for now I guess um, I propose that I give hand over to Frank for a presentation on the paper and I will give it back to you when handing over to Bernard Lehmann. Frank, thank you, Martin. Is. Thank you, Martin. It's a very exciting moment and thank you all for joining us on this. 
Um, the starting point is that if we look at the way we farm and eat today, it has major implications on health, environment and social well-being. On the other side, if we manage to get agriculture and food systems right, they can become a strong positive force. Um, they can, I just see in the chat there, you lost us. I hope everybody can still hear us. Should be fine. Okay, sorry. Um, it can be a solution that, for example, contributes to carbon sequestration, to soil fertility increase, to agri-biodiversity improvement, water retention, rural incomes, healthy nutrition. We can continue this list. So in that way, if we set this right, we can contribute in one go to several of the sustainable development goals. And if you take these sustainable development goals, there are various dimensions on an axis uh, in a graph. Then we see that today global agriculture and food systems, they are rather on a low level. So the number of producers, some are lower, some are higher. And what we need to do in the next, say, 10 years, we need to considerably shift this curve, gradually improving the performance of all systems which is the sustainable intensification approach um, which is there. However, proponents of transformative systems like organic agriculture or other agroecological systems, they say, no, wait a moment, that's not enough. We need to substantially redesign farming systems based on agroecological principles. And thousands of studies have shown that organic and agroecological systems in average are more sustainable. So we need to scale them up while further improving their performance. And proponents of these two approaches often fight fierce battles on which approach is more promising. And as we illustrate in this graph and as we explain later over the course of this webinar, both approaches are needed and they are synergistic. Organic systems can be very strong driver for sustainable intensification. And on the other side, organic systems can also benefit from certain sustainability innovations in so-called mainstream systems. But how do we get there? How can we make this needed change happen? And there we see that policy plays a really major role as it defines the rules of the game. It steers farmers, operators through taxes, subsidies or support programs. It influences to a large extent business practices and prices. It triggers research and innovation. Funding research is an important function or running your university um, research programs. And it influences public awareness and consumer behavior. So therefore, policy makers have the choice of either perpetuating unsustainable practices and behaviors or triggering more sustainable ones. Now, how can that work? We identified four levers of types of measures that drive sustainability. They are one, to support transformative systems like organic agriculture, while also helping to improve their performance. Second, to stimulate demand for, in general, more sustainable products. Third, to incentivize incremental improvements in all systems whether organic or conventional or whatever. And fourth, raising the legal requirements or what is acceptable in the industry in a certain sector um, to a, a significant amount. And please note that only the first of these proposed levers, they are specific to organic agriculture and agroecological systems, while the other three, they apply to all systems. Now, I ask uh, Adrian Müller from the Research Institute of Organic Agriculture to run us briefly through these four policy levers in more detail and to give some examples. Adrian, the floor is yours. Sorry, we had to unmute you. Now you can talk, hopefully. So you hear me now? Wonderful. Okay, thanks. Um, yes, so the first policy lever is the supporting the transformative systems. And there it is, as already said, it is not only about 
uh, increasing the, the, the systems tremendously. It's also about improving them because they tend to be sort of in the more sustainable on, on average area, let's say, of, of all production systems. But they, they are not necessarily all sustainable, that is clear. So there is also distribution. So we can increase their share and we also can further improve them or have to improve them. And we have several measures for this. And one is, for example, a push measure to support research and advisory services. So uh, from the research budget we have in agriculture, only really a tiny part is going to these production systems. And we can have the area-based payments to support these production systems, be it organic or if it's codified others. And we have pull measures that sort of work more on the on the output side. So it's promotion of products from the systems, organic products, like, for example, by targeting organic shares in public procurement and so on. So there's a, a number of policy measures that can be used to work on this first uh, uh, type of policies. And this has to be supported by more knowledge on those because we still have a lack of knowledge on the performance of many aspects of the systems and on supporting institutions for those. And I think this is a key part that in current policies, we have often the case that institutions are not consistently supporting sustainable food systems from whichever production system. And part of it is to really support these sort of transformative systems. So the second lever, can you switch the slide or can I do it? Oh, I can do it. Is stimulating demand for more sustainable products. So we go from the production side to the consumption side. And this is a key thing which is often neglected in the agricultural policies. Uh, where we also tend to say we should go maybe from an agricultural policy to a food system policy. And one part is that we have to raise consumer awareness of the linkages between agriculture, environment, health, and social well-being, so that there is really a knowledge around in societies what it is about. And this can be done, for example, by information campaigns, by increasing uh, the, these topics in educational curricula, such things. And another approach is again via sort of large scale food providers such as caterers or retailers, or, or let's say sort of at the end of the value chain providers directly to the consumers. If they commit to uh, supply sustainable products, if they commit to supply maybe lower shares of animal source food and so on, we can also go there on the consumption side into the direction of more sustainable food systems. So this is the second lever working on the demand. The third lever is sort of setting incentives for improvements in all production systems. So really as the second one, really dip independent of which production system and there a key aspect would be to apply full cost accounting, which is still not widely or hardly never used in agriculture, maybe. And it's sort of not to work via subsidies mainly, but to work via internalization of external costs. And still the, the subsidy side has to play a part, for example, by payments for existing services. But the tax part, tax is not a good work to use. I know it in a policy discourse, but sort of the, the part to internalize the external costs is an important part. And this would, for example, apply to harmful pesticides or to external nitrogen input. The, this would be quite big levers to improve the performance of currently intensive production systems. And they would work on all production systems so they're not targeted to organic or to to any other system they are just targeting uh, main drivers of unsustainable development and then the fourth lever is okay uh sort of on on the lower end of the performance raising legal requirements and industry norms just to avoid sort of the worst practices and there we could also improve by uh, prohibiting or banning certain products or, or practices, uh, be it li like uh, deforestation, or also by having sort of agreements of key players on certain sustainability standards, which are higher than uh, 
the, the current requirements and which may then become legal requirements to really assure that we avoid diverse production systems. Examples that go in this direction are the roundtables on responsible soil, for example. Um, with this short tour through these four policy levers, I give back to Frank Eihorn for some more synthesizing remarks, I think. Sorry, I need to unmute myself. <laughs> Thank you, Adrian. What are the ways forward? What should governments do? Um, first of all, coherently align policies, not only agricultural, but also food system, environmental policies with the sustainable development goals. Secondly, only support systems that deliver to these sustainable development goals. So under the slogan, public funds for public goods, it's an old slogan, but I think today it really is meaningful. And I'm keen to hear from the policymakers how they see that. Third, to overcome vested interests that influence policies. And that's a very important point because the current system has interest in perpetuating itself. And we now have societal interests. They may be needed to, to be weighed stronger than these vested interests. So we need to find a way to overcome these barriers. And a fourth point um, is altogether to recognize that transformative systems like organic agriculture or agroecological systems, they can be important drivers for developing more sustainable options. They are kind of research and development department of agriculture and food systems. They can also help to change consumer demand because it's a way to cons communicate to consumers what uh, sustainability means. It can inspire mainstream systems. They can adopt certain practices from organic systems. And also they help lifting the bar of what is acceptable because they show there is an alternative. So I believe it's really time that we get out of this polarized view of it's either tomorrow everything organic or tomorrow everything conventional. We can really um, combine these approaches and together try to move systems into the right direction. Martin, I hand over to you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Adrian, very much for this um, short introduction into these four policy levers and then a very broad range of um, um, expectations and recommendations what governments could or should do. Um, this is a perfect um, kind of um, um, linking perfectly to um, giving the floor to the two policymakers. Uh, we will start with Bernard Lehmann and for both we have the same guiding questions. So how do you assess the relevance of the proposed um, products and uh, the, the proposed concept, sorry, and what are the potentials and challenges um, 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 in implementing them in a national policy context? So. Um, I would be very happy if you could share some concrete examples on 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 these, uh, especially on the second one, where it comes to national policy measures, and probably also have a look into nearer future. That would be very much appreciated. And I know it's a difficult task, all in five minutes. Thank you very much, Bernard. The floor is your, yours. Thank you. Good afternoon and good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Yes, yes, we hear we very okay. much, uh, very well. Sorry. Yes, um, I find the the recommendations are really very good, and they sound with also uh, other publications uh, made uh, in this uh, in this area. But I learned in the eight years now as policymaker that uh, policy making is the art to let things really happen. And that is a next step after the recommendations. We have to, to make it, um, make a policy which has the effects on the ground. That is not so easy. But Switzerland started um, 20 years ago or more, 30 years ago with a new policy design uh, on the track of more sustainability. The need was high 30 years ago. The need is still very high. But uh, significant progress uh, could be made in the 
meantime, <clears throat> we have um, a policy system of direct payments. It was created and improved through uh, the years by targeting the financial flows on environmental effects. We have um, <clears throat> so-called basic ecological standards for everybody as a basic condition to be part of other schemes afterwards. And we have several schemes or programs. First of all, a specific support of organic agriculture. Uh, in <clears throat> agriculture in Switzerland, we have also a support of other type of uh, mainstream uh, agriculture uh, systems. The organic um, share in Switzerland is, uh, is not low. It is uh, about 12 to 15 percent of the land used by agriculture and 12 percent of the food in average. This is a, a good level and each year this share is increasing a bit and agriculture is following, following the demand. We have also a lot of other programs, uh, which I said not organic, but like uh, integrated pest management or animal welfare. <clears throat> the speed of the progress is not good enough. That is what we can say today. The progress progresses has been made, but the speed is not enough. We have now a good, a new um, disposition in the Constitution, a new article, Article 104A, which gives the possibility to have more impact with policy on the way in which agriculture produces in the country. We could also have a possibility to drive a bit the consumer and we have the possibility to, 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 to manage a bit the conditions of the products which are imported. That is not easy in the context of WTO, but we have this disposition in our constitution, and this helped us a lot in the, the free trade agreements for Indonesia, for example. Now with the new policy design for the 20s, also for the, for the future, we have the objective to go far away uh, on, on this way, especially uh, with the support of reduced use of inputs like pesticides or fertilizer. We want to support climate-friendly production, also carbon sequestration, maybe by agroforestry, and uh, to boost the quality of uh, biodiversity uh, as, uh, as example. <clears throat> But we have also the objective to keep the productivity uh, of the production so that it is necessary to have also the support of the research to have both goals at the same time, more sustainability, ecological sustainability, but keeping the, the level of the, the productivity. And uh, we have also to have the farmers on board. That is one of the biggest challenge I have personally in the policy making. Uh, it is easy to say farmers should be a part of the solution, but uh, they have to accept to be a part of the solution. And um, one way and one key for that is that uh, we have to make ecological productivity attractive, economically attractive, profitable. And that's the reason why we move a huge amount of money of basic direct payment to the to the new category of uh, targeted direct payment for more for improvements uh, for new product production systems in the article and also in the presentation before you mentioned you we have to redesign in fact we will redesign the production systems and we try to do it by policy by a policy framework in order to cover maybe 80% in the first decade, 80% of all the land with these new production systems. We have also discussions with organic farmers in these efforts. And there's also a bit a new situation for them because we bring the other farmers closer to them and we should also 
have the consumer on board because these products are then close to organic on the market and um, we have to 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 have a good communication that organic is is um, the first the elite of this production and the others are close to but not but not organic but we have to live with this situation that we will have a near organic agriculture close to organic and i think um, you have in your paper a chart a sub uh, chapter on fostering the demand on sustainable food products it is not so easy to have policy measures uh, for the consumer. Um, we have we try also to boost uh, the supply in the sense of sustainability, and we think also that supply can drive demand a bit. And we need the efforts of the retailers. The retailers in Switzerland made also big uh, contribution for a more sustainable uh, consumption. That would be my introduction in this uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernard, um, for this um, um, reaction on the paper and also for your thoughts on, on the relevance of the proposed concepts. So I don't want to make it much longer. I would like to directly give the floor to Niraja um, on your view from the Indian perspective on the paper and probably also invite you uh, kindly to share a few concrete examples on how you think these different levers are somehow um, taken up in Indian policymakers for agriculture. Thank you. Systems. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Uh, hope I'm uh, audible. Hello? Yes, yes we can hear you well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. It is evening in India, but I think uh, in Switzerland it is uh, afternoon. So good afternoon. Uh, I think first of all, I should uh, congratulate the authors of this paper for bringing out the concept paper on organic farming as a sustainable policy measure for achieving sustainable development goals by 2030. Uh, we all know that it's very relevant for the present scenario of global warming and climate change. And our organic farming will certainly help in achieving the SDG goals. And we, in uh, you know, uh, may, in most part of India, we have the conventional agriculture. But the ex negative externalities, as uh, highlighted by the paper, they can be neutralized by adopting some of these organic farming. And I am very happy to inform you that India has already adopted uh, this organic farming. Uh, I would like to inform you that India has uh, uh, constituted a task force for uh, to understand, you know, about the organic farming importance. And the task force has come up with a recommendation that at least 10% of the area should be under organic farming. As per the recommendation, there should be 14 million hectares of uh, area uh, in India should be under organic farming. But at present, we are having nearly 3 million hectares of organic farming, either under third party certification or under PGS. PGS is one of the you know certification systems which is fast emerging as one of the um, yeah, you know successful alternative to costly third party valuation, uh, third party certification in India. We have already, and I am also happy to inform you that we have uh, we have already come up with uh, two three schemes. Uh, one I can say uh, the natural farming, uh, which is called in our uh, national language Hindi as Paramparagat Krishi Vikas Yojana. That is uh, for the farmers. We provide the incentives for imports. It is like handholding the farmers in groups because you know unless you get the produce in. Uh, quantity which can be uh, you know sold and marketed uh, it is not possible for a uh, you know farmer to market so uh, clusters or farmer produce organizations are uh, you know uh, they are encouraged in uh, India and these uh, uh, clusters are given the training or handholding by states or the provincial governments through certain agencies who are already having the experience in having the organic farming and then they provide the inputs to certain extent and once the organic products are, uh, once the uh, you know the yield is uh, like the products like rice or wheat whatever vegetables then they uh, take the certification process 
uh, and then marketing is a labeling. Uh, there is also a provision for labeling and you know marketing. So in every step in the value chain, the farmers are handholded and they are getting the help of the government in marketing the produce. At the same time, we have northeastern region, which is very rich in its own kind of, uh, you know, horticultural and uh, spices. So, as per our government, our uh, prime minister uh, has envisaged that northeastern region of the country should be having an export. He also speaks about green revolution, uh, sorry, organic revolution in India. So, we are progressing towards it. So another, uh, as I said, one is Paramparagat Krishi Vikas Yojana, one scheme, and the other one is Mission Organic Value Chain Development, which it is in the northeastern region. There we are promoting ginger, uh, turmeric, rice, cardamom, the spices, majorly spices, and pineapple, uh, and uh, the red chili, which is very local, we, we can say geographical indicator of the northeastern region. So uh, uh, on the whole, I can say, the government of India is already on the job. The four uh, pillars are the levers which you have explained. We have already taken up uh, like the push factor to the research. I would tell you that ICR, Indian Council of Agriculture Research, it has already got um, uh, two, three institutions. I would name like there is one Indian Institute of Farming System Research at uh, Modi Puram, one of our uh, area. And the second one, there is another research institute whole and solely dedicated for national organic farming so uh, we are also so icr is also working hand in hand with the developmental wing of the minister of agriculture for supporting the organic uh, agriculture and the same time i would like to inform you that there is you know package of practices for organic farming under different integrated farming systems has been developed by icar and that has been disseminated to all the provinces and to the uh, you know the practitioners uh, so, which can be adopted by them as per their uh, requirement. Uh, similarly, you also tell about those push and pull factors. Push factor, as I said, ICR is doing research. We have come up with two, three, uh, you know, the programs, which are already by, through these programs, I think through third party certificate, there is one other, another agency, EPEDA, which is an export uh, supporting agency that is doing for export of these organic products through third party certification. So together uh, in PGS and third party certification, we have already covered 3 million hectares of area. That is, I think, uh, uh, 30 lakh hectares um, yeah, under organic farming in India. And it is still increasing. Even um, I, unlike in Switzerland, the awareness for organic farm, organic products and the, you know, the conscious people have become very healthy uh, and uh, health conscious. And they are uh, some of the, like in many metros, I can say, metro cities, people are willing to, you know, shell out any amount of money to become uh, healthy by consuming organic products. But cost of the organic pro products is one of the challenges. I would explain those challenges afterwards. So the push and pull factors, whatever you have, pull factors, as I said, we are promoting the, uh, uh, you know, the entrepreneurial involvement in processing and marketing. And we are, um, we are working like an MNC to, put in those things. And similarly, increasing demand for sustainable products, yes, we have, a, a, you know, I, I'm very happy to inform you that we have got an e-commerce portal for Jaivik Kheti, mean for the organic produce, which is uh, promoted by the government of India, which is taking up in a very uh, good shape. And we are also trying to go for food literacy, like, you know, child, if you can inculcate this habit in the child, it would definitely go to the uh, system. So we are planning to have this kind of education in the curriculum of the child that we will uh, uh, start uh, uh, maybe this year. And then incentivizing improvements of mainstream systems. As I said, you know, um, some of the uh, agricultural practices like integrated farming systems, and soil health card based uh, nutrient use, micro irrigation, they are being promoted by the government so that you can have sustainable, uh, you know, systems in place. And legal requirements, we have come up with now FSSA, the Food and Safety Standards uh, Authority of India. It has come up with regulations now for organic certification. We have Forest Act that prohibits felling of the trees. And, uh, you know, nitrogen, see, but organic farming, as you rightly said in the beginning, organic farming cannot take 
whole and soul responsibility of food security so both conventional and organic should go hand in hand initially and uh, india has certainly has a potential you say you asked about what is the potential in india as i said we have got at least 60% of the uh, you know cultivable area under rain fed conditions and hilly and tribal areas we are targeting these areas initially and then we we will certainly um, i think the, as the trend indicates the organic farming in india will increase as the demand for organic products is increasing and then challenges first challenge as rightly said yes we have a fertilizer uh, thing which we are spending lot of amount for fertilizers but somehow it is uh, it certain if uh, certain integrated nutrient management using fertilizers is required for certain reasons also and for food security also so it, we have to take cautiously step uh, about that second thing is convincing the farmers see organic farming in many of the researchers uh, as as you also your policy paper also says initially there is a decrease in yield so farmers have to be uh, convinced about the importance of it so uh, that uh, that we are doing and then the, that's a very tricky also and we are trying to do and that for that you should have a regular and good markets then only it can happen and continuous hand holding for the farmers since its organic farming is technically and for the certification point of view also it is a bit uh, tricky one so farmers have to be hand holded and we have the programs but there are certain implementation glitches which are very local or for us but we will be taking care of it and market providing the market for organic see farmers in india i have gone from nook and corner of the country in india to uh, review my schemes in the uh, you know field what farmer wants is a good market and water if you can provide these two things he can go for anything so organic farming we are uh, taking these two things are base and we are going uh, ahead in the organic farming and for me i feel it should be like a farm to fork model where you can go for a contract farming also so that based on the uh, uh, you know the requirement of the uh, the company or maybe the consumers then the farmer should produce i think that model instead of farm to fork it should be fork to farm and we are definitely working towards it i think whatever and uh, another thing you said about is about uh, you know awareness generation we have i think uh, we already we are already on job we have come up with you know uh, video spots on uh, uh, what is organic agriculture how certification is done and what consumer should see while provide uh, you know taking up organic produce and we are also involving the children uh, like you know our ads would be looking at our from the child point of view so that if you can influence a child we can certainly have a you know influence the parents and others so we are working in all the directions whatever you have uh, uh, said in the paper we have already implemented or some of them if we if we have not implemented we will be directly going forward towards it and i think it's really really a good concept paper but i think from concept to practical thing we have already done and we will be doing it thank you thank you very much narajaya for this input and um funny enough or maybe you had an eye on the chat you also already took up a few questions from the audience especially when it comes to okay how can we inform public and consumers about the importance of sustainable in agriculture and for me one striking element both of you berno and nerojaya mentioned was and also mentioned in the chat already was around the topic of food policy coherence and the question of is it is it the ultimate goal to seek for a food system policy or are we overburdening the policy system by its complexity then knowing how complex food systems are knowing how difficult it is to um attract or connect with consumers um about sustainability issues so maybe one question on on the coherence part so um sorry for that but i ask you narajaya to also then add on but maybe the example is not a bit more from a swiss system because it's it's a bit more familiar to me um berno switzerland supports a lot of measures practices in sustainable production but in the meantime it also incentivizes um, practices or inputs by lower tax levels or by supporting um um 
sector organizations which try to sell more meat and that's kind of yeah, you have different targets in the same ministry and different measures to try to support agriculture, both from a sustainability lens, but on the other side also from a production lens. So how do you deal with this um, um, incoherency um, or how do you deal with this fact which could be understood as an incoherent policy? Yeah. Thank you for this, uh, for this question. Of course, um, it is um, difficult to live with these uh, incoherences, but um, the first step is to explain to all the um, stakeholders that we have incoherences and to create and to provoke a discussion about these uh, incoherences. We will have, uh, or I will have in one hour or less, um, a long debate with parliamentarian commissions um, about um, two initiatives um, demanding a ban for the use of pesticides. And the discussion will also be very similar to this discussion. We should, we should, we should. Uh, from each uh, perspective, we should act. But the collective will never have a majority from, to make a first step. The first point is taxes on fertilizer or pesticide. The price are too low and it is too easy to use them uh, for everything so that it should be a first step. But we, it is not possible to have a majority because more than the half of the stakeholders are negatively touched. Also the, the commerce with all these uh, this, uh, inputs. And we have a too low um, tax, uh, value added tax on these um, pesticides. And we provoked this discussion. And um, I realized, it is a pity, but I realized that is not uh, the moment uh, for, for that. So that we have to go step by step. And we work more with incentives. Uh, incentives are expensive, that is clear. But uh, it is the, the first or the possible way for the moment with cross-compliance, cross-compliance measures to make step forward. We have uh, not more money for these incentives. And it has also to be said that all this progress farmers should do, they will pay them themselves. Because we will not increase the budget, we will move money from one compartment to the other, and it is, it is not so bad that farmers are on board with this change so that we have also to see the awareness of the farmer is going in the good direction. And I realize uh, all in the public debate that they are a bit wrong with the classical production methods and they are ready to move. But we have also to see that uh, these steps they have to do, we have to make steps in policy, but also the farmers have to make steps himself afterwards. And we have to be respect respectful towards the farmers which will do these steps uh, rapidly. So that uh, I learned to be a bit patient, but uh, patient does not mean that we do nothing. We do a lot of things and together with the farmers. And for the consumer, I would just say, well, not be too long. For the consumer, it is also important to bring consumers near to food, uh, to farm too. But the most important is to bring the consumer to the food and also to all the, the ways food is produced to be aware about the resource use of this, uh, of this food. And we, have, we can bring them to the farmer, but we can also bring them to other uh, stakeholders dealing with food in order to show the resource use of the food. That is the most important information consumers should have, the resource use and the footprint of the food consumption. Thank you very much, Bernard, for this. And um, you, two things you mentioned um, want me or make me wanting to pre bring the ball back to Niracha. Um, one thing was 
you mentioning farmers need time to adapt and the other thing is the um, people's initiative to ban pesticides um, you experienced a complete shift of a um, um, state in India towards organic farming um, could you share some experience how that shift um, was um, executed and what was the farmers reaction to it and how were they able to adapt to this shift from uh, a traditional type of farming system to 100% agriculture that could be also uh, give us some uh, um, hints and, and information for cases here in Switzerland please never turn yeah certainly uh, actually you are hinting at the state of Sikkim uh, yes. like it is now 100% organic uh, what uh, see Sikkim is a hill state and conventionally also the fertilizer consumption is very limited in the state and it's a very peaceful state and it is not a uh, what i can say it is not a it has no major role in the food bowl of india uh, you know rice or wheat or uh, major uh, consumed uh, cereals they are not produced on major quantities in sikkim so that is one reason why you know we could easily do it and the second one is always when there is a will there is a way out the policy makers at the state government has uh, uh, you know tilted towards organic farming so they could adopt it 100 percent and since it is already under uh, you know chemical free farming conventionally uh, or you know by uh, default so the it has been adopted in a very uh, smoothly it has been adopted in the state and second state i want to give you another example andhra pradesh that's in a southern state there the state government has decided that we would adopt one of the uh, one of the variations of organic farming that is uh, ZBNF. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, you know arguments around that also but it's an organic farming we should it's a one kind of chemical free farming we should agree for that so uh, what the government has taken uh, des decided is to uh, convert the entire state into a chemical free state by 2000 uh, i think uh, 30 or something so then now the thing is when there is a decision taken at political level then it would certainly percolate down then the entire machinery starts working in a way that you would start like now i'll take the example of ap they have got a different organization now uh, you know carved out for uh, implementing and rolling out the plan for organic farming uh, you know they are having an entire like in a village two three people they go they are they are stationed in the village and they try to convince the farmers and they are there 24 by 7 and they'll be showing the example of organic farming they are doing organic farming there and showing to the farmers and trying to involve them like a farmer has got see india has got very small uh, land holdings majorly so if there are uh, if a farmer is having uh, five hectares of area they convince him to take up in you know at least one fourth of the area he takes it up and see the result and then he gets convinced and that way you know it's a very uh, it's as uh, rightly said it is very patiently you should uh, be dealing with the farmers and at the end of the day farmers also want to have you know they are agri entrepreneurs farming is an enterprise so uh, you need to be looking into their profit things also like if you talk about sustainability without any income to the farmer it would be very difficult so in hand in hand should go these two things one thing you show them how to improve the soil quality by adopting these kind of measures at the same time show him if you have this produce you have this market then i think it certainly can take up and these two states have shown that you know it can be done in a way but ap it is going in a uh, andhra pradesh the state of andhra pradesh is going in a systematic way with a kind of they are leveraging the social structure uh, you know we have uh, women self help groups which are there in the uh, which are uh, formed under other scheme for you know the developmental activities the micro financing and all so they are uh, banking on those groups and trying to involve them in this and it is more of a social movement than a technical uh, uh, you know thing now it has happened in that state so i think other states in india should learn from it and it could be studied by you know world across also i feel 
Thank you very much for these thoughts and also thank you very much for opening up again the, to the social dimension of food system and the, the importance of of having uh, a very close eye on uh, social aspects of food systems, both on the production side but also on the consumption side. Time is running very, very fast. So allow me to open up to a last round of questions and I try to have an eye also on the chat. And there some comments were and uh, questions were towards the field of, okay, who is driving uh, changes in policy making? What is the influence of industry and lobby groups on it? Of course, um, these lobby groups are very diverse, but we have also another kind of um, system which could drive policy changes or priority setting in policy. These are 17 goals of the SDGs. So how do you, um, maybe very briefly, Bernard and Niracha, um, could you please um, be very short in your answer on how SDGs do guide your policy making, your policy design? Should I start? Please. Okay. Um, I forget it to mention the previously SDCs, um, DGs are very important for the redesign of the agriculture policy in Switzerland. It is for us an interesting uh, way to go because uh, Switzerland, as many other countries, participated to the definition and the creation and the design of these SDGs. And now in Switzerland, in our um, responsibility, we have uh, two, uh, three goals to drive with, and we have uh, a completely um, <clears throat> similarity between SDGs and also in the wording of the future agriculture policy in Switzerland. So I am very happy. And this uh, disposition in the constitution I, I mentioned before is also a vehicle to go in line with uh, these SDGs concerning food and concerning resource use for food, concerning food security, and also uh, the, the context of uh, smallholder farming. That is, uh, I would say the first point is SDGs are not a problem for Swiss agriculture policy. In the contrary, it helps us to make progress for the future. Thank you, Benno. Niracha, please, a very short reflection on how SDGs could support policy design also in the Indian context. Yeah, uh, see, uh, the policy, uh, the SDGs majorly say about, uh, you know, the major agriculture policy says about increase in income to the farmer. That that means reduction in poverty, hunger, which are, you know, major uh, concepts of uh, SDG goals. I think agriculture policy in India says about sustainable agriculture also. I think organic farming being one of the vehicle for sustainable agriculture, it can, it is already adopted by the government of india as a policy at policy level as i said we the task force which is constituted in india for the promotion of organic farming it recommended for 10 percent of area and we are already working towards it for covering at least we as we covered 3 million i think it is increasing day by day its awareness among farmers as well as consumers has been rapidly increasing in india about organic farming Okay, thank you very much. Um, before we um, um, shut down all our computers or just shift the screen to uh, ordinary work again, um, I would like to hand over, make a last round among the speakers, starting with Adrian, for just one minute, um, give you the opportunity to um, convey a message which we all take um, home or take back to the desk after this very interesting and inspiring discussion. I suggest that Adrian, you start, Niracha, you follow Bernard next, and Frank, as the host kind of, of this webinar, has the privilege to uh, speak as last. Please, Adrian, one minute. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Um, I would like to start with or to focus on this topic of internalization of external costs, because 
it is a slow process policy making and we have to keep uh, an eye on not losing any stakeholders but in this process I, I just do not see this concept in agriculture to the extent I think it should be used and we should start making this concept um, discussed about and, and really promoting it and, and uh, allowing the time for the stakeholders to accept it because I think this is it doesn't solve everything but this is one important way to follow for example regarding nitrogen which would uh, have beneficial impacts regarding biodiversity eutrophication climate uh, greenhouse gas emissions and so on so I think we should really start taking this serious as this internalization of external costs should become an approach and this would also link to agricultural and food policies because it would be independent of production systems if an organic producer is highly intensive uh, he would also pay for it and it could be linked to sort of local local um, carrying capacities and so on so uh, I just do not yet see this idea reflected in the discussion enough that's sort of my main statement and I would like to see it more thank you Adrian Nirachab, please. Yeah, as a parting re remark, I, what I would say is, yes, uh, as a agriculture a policy level, uh, I think policy makers uh, everywhere, including India, I will uh, talk in the context of India, they need to look at the food security also, because ours is the second most populated country along with sustainable kind of, uh, you know, organic farming systems. So I think uh, we are doing, um, I think, uh, properly as far as, uh, you know, the, the concept of today is concerned. Um, I think reducing the fertilizer subsidies is one of the issues which would, uh, I think, uh, in long run we have to look into it. But certainly organic farming will certainly help the, in attaining the SDG goals in a sustainable manner. Thank you very much, Bernard. Final statement from, yes, from Bern. I would say that, um, you had the, the four levers in your paper, which I find very good. Uh, they are all addressed by the Swiss agriculture policy. Mostly we used, of course, the, the pull um, and not the, the push variants. I am also um, an adapt of the internationalization or internalization of external costs. But I mentioned before that uh, we have to, to get majorities uh, for that. But one point is, if farmers pay themselves the progress they have to make, it is also indirectly an internalization of external costs. Uh, that we have not to forget the efforts they will make. <clears throat> and we have the political will, I am sure, for that. Uh, to improve the system and uh, we have to be aware that step by step we will make the biggest progress and not with a revolution thank you thank you bernard and um, frank one minute for a last statement I need less than that because I just pick up two quotes from our wonderful speakers uh, bernard earlier said change is happening we are implementing this approach but progress is too slow and i couldn't agree more and niraja said if there is a will it can be done and i think the will is there also in society we see that th changes are happening so let's get it done thank you very much for this last statement and this uh, promising view into the future before we will uh, do we have also the opportunity to again to talk and to listen and to learn. There is a next webinar on this paper from a European policy lens. It's on the 20th of May at 2 o'clock, organized by Helvetas. Similar uh, condi conditions. Sorry. I uh, it's organized by the Thunen Institute in Germany uh, in collaboration with the EU Commission on Agriculture. Okay, sorry on that, but it's organized again by the authors of the paper and it will be on the paper and that's key. So thank you all participants for taking the time and thank you all um, who 
joined the webinar, who shared their thoughts on the chat function. We tried to um, take that in and um, we um, hopefully have again the opportunity to discuss this on the 20th or on other dates later. Thank you very much. Uh, have a nice afternoon, night, morning, whatever. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank bye. you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.